Well, welcome back to this course on organic chemistry in biology and drug design. Last time, uh, just to recapitulate what we were discussing, we were discussing about that how to purify the protein molecules in a mixture of uh, other proteins. Okay. Now, the basis of purification that means, the, the what are the properties that can be used to separate the proteins are given here. The parameters include molecular weight. So, different proteins have different molecular weights. So, based on the molecular weight there are purification methods which separates on the basis of molecular weight. There are also methods which separates proteins on the basis of the charge that they possess. You remember the proteins uh, are made up of amino acids and uh, it is not only the terminal ends are charged that is NH 3 plus and CO minus, but at the same time there are side chains which can also have positive charge or negative charge. So, the overall charge uh, depends on the on the primary sequence of uh, of the uh, primary sequence means the sequence of amino acids and different proteins have different charge uh, charges to, and that can be utilized to separate via electrophoresis. Okay. Then different proteins have different solubility usually the solubility of proteins in water it will decrease as you add uh, inorganic salts which increase the ionic strength of the solution. So, there are precipitation methods like adding ammonium sulphate which can precipitate proteins and you can maintain different concentration of ammonium sulphate to specifically precipitate various proteins. And the fourth one is called affinity, affinity chromatography and that is that you actually attach a, a molecule which is which has high affinity towards particular protein and then as you elute the protein solution the protein which has got higher affinity uh, with the affinity level that will stick to the column others will pass through and then you can apply some buffer solution to detach the protein which is uh, which is um, attached to the affinity level and then by that way you can purify the proteins. Okay. Now, there are we are going to discuss basically uh, two methods which rely on one on molecular weight and another on the basis of charge. I think yesterday I uh, showed this to you. Now, let us just have a quick glance of the what we have discussed. First thing that we discussed was the purification of proteins by gel filtration this is also called size exclusion chromatography okay because here the a column a glass column is there which is filled up with with uh, macromolecules which have um, which have or polymeric beads those are polymeric beads and they have pores in them and then when you apply the protein solution the large protein solution cannot go through the pores of these beads instead it will just flow through straight away whereas, the medium or the very small size ones that will interact with the pores and then that will their movement will slow down. Okay. So, ultimately what will happen you will have a uh, if you have a chromatogram uh, like this it is the high molecular weight uh, proteins that will uh, that will first come out that means, the molecules which protein molecules which have higher sizes that will come out and followed by the proteins of the uh, lower sizes. Okay. And this was demonstrated by looking in, in these slides that these are the beads and there are many hollow positions uh, in, in, the, in the beads uh, and then when you apply the protein solution which is in this case. Uh, indicated by these colored balls the green one and the and the violet one the violet one is obviously has small size and then there was a something which was uh, blue here the complete picture is not there but that is the biggest one of these of this of this protein mixture so as it percolates through the gel uh, what happens the large molecules you will see that already there is a difference between this uh, violet and the green one 
and the blue one is already here ahead of the green. So, as it as you allow time more time ultimately this is nothing but a gravity filtration. So, it is uh, but the gravity filtration is differentiating between the large and the small molecules and that differentiation is coming because the small proteins are interacting with the pores that are available in this gels. Okay. So, ultimately uh, what will happen the blue ones will elute first followed by the green ones and then the then the violet ones. Okay. So, that was the uh, basis of size exclusion chromatography. So, which is just dependent on the molecular weight and the size. Okay. The, now, the next one that we discussed was SDS page. SDS the full name is sodium dodecyl sulphate, it is a long chain sulfonate. So, it has got negative, it is a negatively charged anion and uh, this page means polyacryl amide gel electrophoresis. So, by this technique one can uh, separate the proteins. Now, here the basis is that that proteins in the native state remains folded and they have a native charge okay? and the charge depends on the side different types of side chains that are present in the proteins. So, uh, first thing that you want to do is to unfold the protein and make them linearized this is needed otherwise what will happen that a small protein uh, may have higher charges and a large protein may have lower charges. So, it is very it is non uniform you cannot really uh, have a process where the small one comes first and the bigger ones come later as uh, or the bigger ones coming first and the smaller ones coming later as was in the case of size exclusion chromatography. But here what you want to do first that first you allow the protein to unfold completely that means, it is a kind of a linear molecule and now the coat the surface of the proteins with HDS molecules which is highly negatively charged. So, the charge density um, per, per unit area in the protein unit area of the surface of the protein uh, remains the same. So, ultimately what happens that if you apply the, the current now if you apply this is the apparatus this is the power supply which supplies the current and this is where you make the sample sample means the protein you mix it with, with SDS, uh, SDS and then you apply that onto the onto the onto the this is mixing and then you have to heat it also to really completely unfold and then as you as I as you uh, heat it. So, what happens in presence of SDS this was the folded protein now it will become linearized and it will be completely surrounded by these are the SDS uh, anion molecules. Okay. So, that the same thing will happen with this YOLO, YOLO one also whatever proteins which are unfolded uh, they will be unfolded and they will be just covered by the negative charges. So, now if you apply voltage what will happen the smaller ones uh, because of their small molecular weight. So, they will come first their mobility will be high and the larger ones will come later. Okay. So, you are now applying the solution of the protein which is denatured with HDS and then you apply the voltage and as you apply the voltage current flows and then you see the back the bigger ones fall behind then the medium ones move little faster and the smaller one are the first fastest. And usually what happens you put a colored dye which uh, is known to move the fastest and uh, that is just an indicator that how much time you will allow for the electrophoresis. Okay. So, when you add the protein solution you add a dye and then the dye moves the fastest. So, when the dye comes here at the top then you stop the electrophoresis stop the volt the current and then take this out and then you dip it in a solution of another dye which is called Kumasi blue and then in the Kumasi blue you will uh, after working up you first soak it in Kumasi blue solution and then after Kumasi blue you put it in acetic acid methanol solution and the Kumasi blue where there is no protein that is not bound to the gel that will just wash off and wherever there are proteins they will appear as this dark blue spots okay, or bluish violet type of 
spots that you get and the number of spots will tell you the at least the minimum number of proteins that you have in your solution. Uh, why I am saying minimum number because this spot looks like a spot is one, but you never know that how many proteins there may be several proteins which will have similar molecular weight and they may be coming as one spot. Okay. So, that has to be uh, if you want to know whether there is other proteins here then this this SDS page cannot distinguish between that no? because SDS page is under denaturing condition. So, if you want to see whether there are more number of proteins than one then you have to do another type of electrophoresis you can do uh, that is the which basically based which is uh, based on the native charge actual charge uh, in the native form and that will differ from one protein to another. So, if you do native electrophoresis rather than that means you drop the SDS and do only the page polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis that is called the uh, native gel electrophoresis. This is called electrophoresis under denatured condition and then you can tell whether this spot is actually one protein or is it a, a multiple of proteins are present here. So, different techniques you have to apply in order to really know the purity of a protein. Just appearing a single band in the Kumasi blue does not tell the number of proteins that are present. Okay. There are other techniques also there, but we are not going into that the best is do the native page and the also the SDS page if you are not very sure how many proteins are there here. So, up to that point I think we did this is the native proteins for the native protein uh, native protein uh, no, native protein is basically the charge that is present uh, in the protein itself and they will move according to their charge and this charge also depends on the pH. So, the pH also needs to be adjusted and you can uh, by adjusting the pH and doing the electrophoresis you can vary the charge the native charge on the protein and that can also help you to separate the proteins by native gel electrophoresis. Now, charge on the proteins we know that there is a point that means there is a pH where amino acids uh, become neutral that means there is no charge in the amino acid. The same thing happens with protein proteins also also have a pH which is called the isoelectric point. They also have an isoelectric point where the charge is net charge is 0. So, the protein will not move there. Okay. Now, the question is how do you determine the isoelectric point of a protein okay. because it's, it will be very difficult to really calculate there are ways possibly to you have so many PKAs now in the protein. So, it will be very difficult to really pinpoint what is the isoelectric point. Now, there is a technique which is called isoelectric focusing that is also a gel electrophoresis method, uh, but it is very interesting that oh, I think that is uh, possibly later on this isoelectric focusing this is the gel native gel electrophoresis that I already told yes isoelectric focusing we will come later on we will come to that uh, whatever earlier was that was ion exchange column chromatography. But before that let us because we are on the uh, electrophoresis. So, let us uh, finish up the electrophoresis. Now, first one was SDS page again I just revisit SDS page that is under denatured condition. The second one was the native gel electrophoresis that is whatever the uh, intrinsic charge that is present in the protein. Uh, but I told you that can vary according to the different pHs. Now, the question is how to know the isoelectric point of a protein because if you know the isoelectric point then you can adjust the pH to move the proteins to different directions. So, the and that will allow you to separate the proteins. Now, the isoelectric point uh, this isoelectric focusing is a technique that gives you uh, that allow you allows you to know what is the iso, uh, isoelectric point that means what is the pH uh, where the protein does not have any charge. What is, is done is basically I can show it here. So, basically you have you are running a gel electrophoresis, but the gel is little different here the gel 
has a pH gradient. That means, different the pH slowly increases from say here to there. The pH of the gel, there are ways to do that. So, the pH of the gel slowly increases from say top to bottom. Okay. And now, what you do? You apply your protein solution, you apply your protein solution and and they will move. Okay. Now, as soon as the protein, suppose the every protein usually the proteins uh, you start with the pH very low pH is highly acidic, where the it is very unlikely that the protein will have an isoelectric point where the pH is 1 that is very unlikely. So, if you start with pH 1, now remember suppose this is the pH of the solution. If the isoelectric point of a protein is suppose here in this direction the pH is increasing. If the isoelectric point of a protein is suppose here that means it is less than the pH that is maintained here and if the isoelectric point uh, if of another protein is on the right side of the pH that what you are maintaining then what will happen this protein will have will have uh, uh, it is basically now it will be positively charged and here it will be negatively charged and here it will be now 0. Okay. So, basically you have to suppose here the pH is suppose 4 in this region and suppose here the pH is 5. Now, what will happen this protein will a, there are two proteins suppose one is having a pi of uh, suppose this is 6 suppose one having pi of 4.5 okay, and this is 4.5 and suppose this is the uh, we are talking about different pHs. So, I am not writing the pH here and the other protein has a has a pi suppose of 5.5. Now, then what will happen when the protein moves the protein 1 which has got a pi of 4.5. So, as soon as it reaches the region where it is 4.5 somewhere here it stops here because now it is it will lose the it will lose the it will be neutral here at this pH. So, it's it stops here does not move and what about the other protein which is 5.5. So, that will now come up to 5.5 where it will become 0 at that point it will be neutral. Okay. So, basically now depending on different pi's this is what is called isoelectric focusing. So, you are basically focusing or you are basically collecting all the proteins at a particular pH which is equal to its isoelectric point. Okay. So, that is why this is called isoelectric focusing. Focusing means you are pinpointing something towards a towards a particular region. So, this region will where the protein which has got an isoelectric point of 4.5 that will stop here and the other one will stop here. If there is another protein which has got a suppose pi of 7, so that will stop there. Okay. So, these are the this is what is how do you determine. So, that means now if you uh, know the pH of this region this is you know 4.5. So, you can determine you can tell that the pi the isoelectric point of the protein is 4.5. Okay. So, basically wherever the protein stops and that the zone of the pH of that zone is what is the isoelectric point of the system. Okay. So, by this way you determine the you determine uh, the, I, the isoelectric point. Okay. So, now we have we have discussed the SDS page, the gel filtration, the isoelectric focusing and the native gel electrophoresis. We will discuss I think maybe one or two more separation techniques, uh, maybe one more and that is called ion exchange chromatography. Okay. Ion exchange chromatography is basically what happens that you have a you have a say glass column it looks like this and there is a stopper here and you fill that with polymeric beads again these are polymeric beads which are either negatively charged or 
could be positively charged or um, or could be neutral also both positive and negative. If you have so what I am saying that if you have beads see one cannot have only negative charges because after all the whole thing is electrically neutral. So, if you have something some polymer suppose and this polymer ends up with say SO 3 minus and Na plus. Say a polymer which has got polymeric chain which is all SO 3 minus and Na plus. So, that means these beads are mainly made up of this aliphatic sulfonic acid and on these sulfonic acids what happens? Uh, the sulfonic acid surface is all negatively charged and then there is a sodium ion which is attached to this to these beads. So, the sodium ions are attached to the beads, the beads are negatively charged. Okay. So, that is why this is called uh, these are resins which are ion exchange resins. There could be again another type of polymer where there could be N R 3 plus and say C L minus. Now, what will happen? It will be just the reverse that you have a column where there are beads and these beads are now all positively charged and this is surrounded by all the chloride ions negatively charged chloride ions. Okay. Now, what will happen when you add the protein solution here, when you add the protein solution say at a in an acidic pH, then proteins are expected to be positively charged because I said that an acidic pH uh, the isoelectric point of proteins are usually greater than 4 or 5 it ranges from 4 to uh, 4 to say 10 even 10 is a little unusual. Uh, so, that is um, that depends on the number of arginines, number of lysines, whatever the number of basic residues, acidic residues all these considering all these usually they range from say suppose 3 to 8. So, if you take a protein solution which has got uh, in a pH 2. So, it is expected that all the proteins will be positively charged and now if you add that solution here all the positively charged protein solution you attach here. So, what will happen now because the beads are negatively charged which is surrounded by sodium ions. Now, the sodium ions will be released from the beads and the proteins will get will get stuck to these beads now. So, the now the charge uh, plus uh, the charge charge interactions will take place between the protein and the beads. Now, different proteins the extent of charge as I said in a protein that depends on the pH. It is true that at a particular pi at a particular pH the the charge is 0, but, but before that it is positively charged, but the extent of positive charge will be different at different pHs. That means, what I am saying suppose the P i of a protein is say 6.0. Now, the question is below 6.0 we know that it is positively charged and above 6.0 it is negatively charged, but the extent of positive charge that also will depend at what pH you are maintaining. The lower the pH the more positively charged species you will get. Okay. So, that means, the extent of charge on a protein at a particular different proteins at a particular pH although it is lower than the pi, but the charge density will vary. That means, their interaction with the solid uh, matrix this uh, these beads or what are called resins that will be different. Okay. So, what does it really then ultimately what happens that those proteins which are stuck to the first initially the sodium ions go out and the proteins will get attached to the to the resin beads and then you what you do you increase the that solution that solvent that you are that you want to elute with that is called the solvent or the uh, or the uh, that is the elution the eluent uh, that eluent you slowly increase the pH. Okay. If you increase the pH different proteins will have different charge densities. So, their interaction with the bead will be different. So, some proteins will try will now strip off this will be stripped off from this solid resins and they will come out faster than the others. I think the next few slides will will clear that whole thing what I am saying. Okay. Now, 
Yes. Now, what happens if you take this is a protein which is having a negative charge, overall negative charge. That means, this protein is kept in a pH which is above the isoelectric point of the of the protein. Okay. So, if it is negatively charged, so it should be now it can compete with the hydroxide ions or the anions while when it binds to the bead. So, it will call earlier a bead is possibly surrounded it is a positively charged bead which is surrounded by all these hydroxide ions. Okay, these are minus hydroxide. So, all these hydroxide ions are surrounding this these beads. Now, when you add the protein which is also negatively charged that means, you are having a pH which is higher than the pi then it will start displacing the hydroxide and instead the protein molecule is going to attach to this bead. Okay. On the other hand if you go to the pH which is lower than the isoelectric point now it will compete with the H plus or it will compete with the other counter anion like sodium plus uh, or potassium whatever the bead has and then it will what it will do it will displace the H plus because now the bead that you are going to use is negatively charged and earlier this is all surrounded by H plus and when you add this protein the H plus will be knocked out and you will get the protein which is now delta plus that will be attached to the bead. Okay. So, now the bead switch and then as you increase the pH of the of the eluent then what will happen the proteins where the charge density is less they will start coming off faster than the proteins where the extent of positive charge is more. Okay. So, if that happens uh, then you have a separation you have a separation of the proteins according to their extent of positive charge at different pHs. Now, this is what is called cation so exchange process when you are exchanging the when your bead is negatively charged and your protein is exchanged in place of hydro this hydrogen ion. So, the hydrogen ions are displaced and the bead is negatively charged. So, it is a cation exchanger the cations which were earlier H plus that is replaced by the cationic protein okay. and the earlier one is obviously, it will be the anion exchanger it will be called anion exchange resin because here the exchanging is taking place between the hydroxide and the negatively charged protein. Okay. So, very simple now I will show you some slides that how it works and at the isoelectric point it is basically it does not compete with anything it is it will be detached from the bead because the overall charge is 0. So, this is suppose this is the bead the whole the bead is like this and the bead is, is this is anionic uh, and this is the bead has a uh, has a negative charge. So, this is this is cation exchanger because this is surrounded by all these cations to start with. Now, as you add protein the protein has positively charged you keep the protein solution in acidic pH so that it is positively charged. So, it will be now it will be bound to this resin displacing this positively charged counter ions and then as you so what will happen as you increase the pH now the protein suppose this is the movement the movement of the proteins on in this direction. So, now what will happen this has got two delta pluses. So, as the solvent flows through it the one which has got the lowest delta the charge positively charged that will first move out because that is in the interaction with the uh, resin will be the minimum there. So, as you raise the pH it goes out followed by the ones followed by the one which has got two, two positive charge means here it is showing that it has got more positive charges this has got even more positive charges. So, the last one to elute is the one which has got the highest uh, positive charges. Okay. It actually it is tied up with the there is a relation between the pi and this extent of positive charge that means, how much you have you are below the isoelectric point if this this is actually very close to the isoelectric point 
of this protein. So, that will come first. Then as you increase the pH, the P i of this is reached. So, then this will come out. As you increase the pH further, then you reach the P i of this and then it will detach from here and it will go out of the column. Okay. So, that is the principle of what is called ion exchange chromatography. Okay. I think so. Now, we have uh, all these uh, different techniques. I just uh, tell you about a little bit of two dimensional gel electrophoresis, because these days earlier what happens the, the biologists were trying to identify the proteins uh, individually one by one. Now, if you we do not know how many proteins are there uh, in an organism. In an organism if you if I tell what is the number of proteins it is very difficult, but after the human genome project when we know the entire genome now there is uh, we are more or less certain that about 30,000 proteins are there in the human body. Okay. But if you, if you have an unknown species organism okay, and there are thousands and thousands of proteins and if you want to identify one by one then it will take hundreds of years to really identify and characterize all the proteins. Instead what is done is what is called um, proteomic study. Proteomics basically is the proteomics means is a study of proteins all proteins which are together. Now, you are not deciding on one by one. So, what you are doing you do what is called two dimensional gel electrophoresis. Remember here what is done first in one dimension you do the isoelectric focusing isoelectric focusing technique. That means, where the proteins are separated by their isoelectric point. Okay. Suppose, there are these spots that you get, but I, I uh, earlier told you that each spot may be containing again hundreds of proteins. So, then basically what you are thinking there is one protein that is not actually correct. They are should be other methods to resolve to separate these proteins. How it is done? Now, what you do this is the diamond first elect isoelectric focusing that means, you have a pH gradient here. Next what you do you turn it upside down and now all the point all the bands are here now. I am just taking four bands and now what you do you do a uh, HDS page you do an HDS page. So, if you do HDS page now according to molecular weight they will be separated because HDS page is basically that is only depending upon the molecular weight the length of the of the protein. So, if you do that now these are the different spots that you will get okay. and when you get these different spots like suppose this. So, there are now methods that you take this gel out from here and directly put it into the mass spec. There is a special technique called MALDI that is a matrix assisted laser desorption ionization spectroscopy. So, if you now do mass spectrometric analysis you can know what is the structure, uh, structure of this protein. So, you take the band from here you know the structure what is the protein here at this point. Okay. So, this is what is called because you are doing two uh, you are doing two electrophoresis uh, in in two different directions two different directions means if you do not make it upside down then basically you are applying the field in this direction. So, that is this is one dimension the first dimension is isoelectric focusing and the second dimension is the HDS page by that technique you can separate separate all the proteins in a gel and then you can pick up individual spots go to the mass spec and the mass spec analysis uh, ultimately it is actually really pretty complicated it appears to be uh, simple in technique, but ultimate analysis when you have huge mass spectral data then it is the job of the bioinformatic people to know the what is the structure of the protein. So, that is uh, the present day technology which is uh, which they do this is 
identifying all the proteins together at the same time that is what is called the proteomics. Okay. So, thank you.